Hello, everybody. Uh, hello to the uh, people who are watching online. My name is Chris McCabe. I'm uh, Chief Executive of the Institute of Health Economics here uh, in Alberta. And it is uh, my great pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome Dr. Carl Claxton from the University of York, who's going to talk to us about uh, estimating cost effectiveness thresholds for Canadian provinces. I've known Carl for more years than we like to think about. Uh, and he continues to be uh, an inspiration to me uh, in the quality and the rigor of his work and his ability to have impact on the real world of our healthcare systems and how we do things. So uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk uh, on this topic. So I'll get out of the way and you can uh, hear from Carl, please. Thank you very much, Chris. It has been more years than we care to remember. I am actually a very old man. The only reason why I look this good is because of Boots number no. 7, moisturiser. Uh, all my life is evidence-based, and uh, particularly my male grooming. And it is the only moisturiser with randomised controlled trial evidence of an effect on the dermis of the skin. So I don't know if you're able to access Boots number no. 7 in Canada, but if you can, uh, I'd strongly recommend it. Oh dear, I'm drooping. That's uh, age as well. Um, yeah, this is not good. All right. There we go. That'll, that's better. So yeah, listen, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Getting here was a bit of a game. Uh, missed my flight in Toronto, but as a consequence, I had lots of time on the plane. So. I uh, was able to get some, uh, get some work done. So, let's make a start. Uh, why do we care about cost effectiveness and the notion of some threshold? Well, one reason, it's not the only reason, but one reason why, why me, we might care about it is to start to think about how much we can afford to pay for the benefits that a new investment for our healthcare system might offer, and in particular, how much we can afford to pay for the benefits that a new branded pharmaceutical might offer. These are important policy questions that uh, are, 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 are very current across healthcare systems, both in Canada, I know, but particularly in the United Kingdom at the moment. The PPRS negotiations are ongoing uh, as we speak, basically deciding how much we're going to pay for new branded medicines uh, in the UK. So what price should we pay for the benefits of a new intervention? Well, let's imagine that our healthcare system, the primary purpose of our healthcare system is to improve health. I say primary because it's not the only thing, but at least we can probably agree that an important element of the purpose of healthcare expenditure is to improve health. If you agree with that, we need to be able to measure health. And if we want to measure health, we need a measure of health on the x-axis. Now, I've called it qualies, quality adjusted life years. I understand some people don't like qualies. I agree, it's an ugly acronym. But think about a measure of health that captures the impact that we're likely to have on length of life and the quality in which it's lived with some uh, relationship to how people feel about that trade-off. Now, whatever you've got in your mind, it's going to look like a quality, is the truth. You just don't have to call it a quality. Okay? So it doesn't have to be a quality, but it will look like a quality. So we need a measure of health, and we need to go out and assess the evidence about what are the health effects of this new intervention, and how is that likely to translate into quality effects in the very longer run. Let's imagine this point here is what we've currently got available. So let's imagine there's only one thing available in our healthcare system, and we've got one new intervention. So we need to go out and identify, synthesize the evidence to figure out what the, the additional effects of this intervention are going to be. We also need to know what the additional costs are going to be. Not just counting up the acquisition cost of this new medicine, but taking account of all the potential additional costs through administration or potential cost savings because we've got an effective medicine that avoids some costly events uh, down the line. And let's imagine we've done all that. And to be honest, our field has spent an awful lot of effort over the years in figuring out how to do that. And we've got really quite sophisticated at it. You know, we build decision analytic models. We have Bayesian network meta-analysis. We do probabilistic sensitivity analysis to reflect the uncertainty. So an awful lot of our efforts go into figuring out the X and the Y axis. And let's imagine we've done all that. Let's imagine we've done all that. And this new intervention, this new technology, for every patient treated, imagine we gain two qualities. 
I've never seen a new pharmaceutical that gains you two qualities, more like 0.2 if you're very lucky and possibly 0 0.02, never two. But let's imagine it's really good and we're going to gain two qualities. And at the price the manufacturer has said, which is less than P-Star, it's going to cost us an additional £20,000 for each patient treated. We can summarise what we're getting as for every £10,000 we spend gains as one quality. In other words, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, if you want to use that term, which is a bit of a mouthful, I have to say, is £10,000 per quality. Is it worth it? Should we say yes? Well, to answer that question, it depends absolutely on where this £20,000 is going to come from. Because if we're going to have to find that £20,000 from existing commitments, that means that we are going to take resources away from other effective healthcare. We are going to have to give up health outcomes elsewhere in our healthcare system. If we're going to fund this with new money, we're going to expand healthcare expenditure to accommodate it, we still need to ask the question, what else could we have done with £20,000? Maybe there's something better we could have spent it on. Maybe we could have just given it to the healthcare system without this new technology. What health would we have got? So whether we've got a fixed administrative budget or not, we still need to ask this question. What are the health opportunity costs? What else could we have done with that money? Now let's imagine that we've answered that question. Let's imagine that we've had a look and we think that every £20,000 we have to find could have delivered one quality adjusted life year elsewhere. In other words, health opportunity cost, £20,000 per quality. That is our threshold to judge cost effectiveness. Now, we could say the ISA is less than the threshold. It's cost effective. But actually, that's not what really, that's not the easiest way to think about this. What's really going on here is that we expect to gain two qualities for every patient treated. What do we expect to lose? Well, that £20,000 could have delivered a quality elsewhere. We are losing one quality in opportunity terms somewhere else. So we gain two, we lose one. We have a net health benefit per patient treated of one quality. In other words, there are net health benefits. We are improving health outcomes overall. That's what cost effectiveness is about. Simple as that. What if the manufacturer charged a little bit more for this product? It now charges P-Star. It's going to cost us £40,000 for every patient treated. What does that mean? It means that it's going to cost us £20,000 per quality using this new technology. That's equal to the threshold. What does that mean? Well, it means that the benefits that we gain are just offset by what we lose elsewhere in the healthcare system. There are zero net health benefits. This new innovation, this new technology, neither improves nor damages health outcomes overall. We are paying the maximum we can afford to pay for this new technology. What if we charge a little, what if the manufacturer charges a little bit more, and they always tend to do, let's face it, and it now, we've got a price greater than P-Star, it now costs us 60,000 pounds per patient treated, in other words, £30,000 per quality for this new uh, intervention. Should we approve it? Well, if we do approve it, sure, this is an effective intervention, very effective. Two qualities gained, every patient treated, but you know what? At that price, we are likely to displace three qualities elsewhere in our healthcare system. If we approve at that price, we have a negative net health benefit. We reduce health outcomes overall. We are damaging our healthcare system by approving the technology at that price. In other words, healthcare system costs matter. Why? Because healthcare system costs are resources that could have been devoted to improve health outcomes for other patients. Costs matter, cost their health. If we care about health gains, we have to care about costs because they are the same thing in our healthcare system. Those that said economists know the price of everything and the value of nothing could have been further from the truth. That's accountants. Economists, or good economists at least, only care about the value of things. That's what the discipline is about. Thomas Phillipson. It's all right. Chicago economist. Um, who knows the value of nothing? So, what does this mean? Let's pay P-star. That's the maximum we can afford to pay for this intervention. If we do pay P-star for the intervention... Uh, across its indication, let's imagine there's Q star in the indication, Q star patients. Well, the value of the innovation is P star times Q star. It's this area here. 
Now, if we pay P star, then all value is appropriated by the manufacturer while they continue to hold that patent. We're giving the entire value away. Our healthcare system gets no health benefit from that intervention. We're giving it all away. Net health benefit is zero. Now, that doesn't sound so great. Actually, it's worse. The truth of the matter is that prices are basically global prices. They're set for a global market, and that market tends to be dominated by the largest healthcare system in the world, which is the United States. And that healthcare system does not have an effective demand side. It has no demand side that works in any sensible way. And as a consequence, prices are set for that fractured and broken healthcare system hemorrhaging trillions of dollars but offering very little to the citizens it's supposed to serve. And so as a consequence, list prices tend to be very high and by and large higher than what most healthcare systems can afford to pay. So if this is the global list price, this is how much we can afford to pay, then this area represents the harm that we are going to do to our healthcare system if we accept this pharmaceutical at list price. It also represents the scale of the rebate or discount we're going to have to require of the manufacturer in order to just get to the point where we're willing to approve it for widespread use. Now, none of this sounds great, actually. Even if we got the rebates, we're still gaining nothing during the patent. What's the point in that? Surely the point of a healthcare system is to improve health outcome, and we're paying right up to our maximum we can afford to pay, and as a consequence, not helping patients overall. Well, we will gain in the long run if certain conditions hold. When will we gain? Well, once patents expires and, we have and if we have competitive generic entry, then we get much cheaper versions of that old brand. We certainly do for small molecules. So if we assume that the patent's got a 15 years to run, generic prices are 25% of the brand, so it's a small molecule, we've got competitive generic entry, and all prescribing switches from brand to generic, or we price further, in, introduce brands relative to generic prices of old brands, and we discount 3.5%. This is kind of what it looks like. This is the accumulating total value of the innovation over time. This is the healthcare system share. We get nothing for the first 15 years. We've given it all to the manufacturers. But when patent expires, as long as we can ensure competitive generic entry, we start to claw back some value. And in the very long, long run, the healthcare system's going to get just over 50% of that accumulated total value. So, what we can see is that the issue around pharmacy... I'm going to return to whether that's reasonable or not towards the end, if that's OK. What you can see is it's very different to what we've been told in some of the literature. Thomas Phillips and Jenner published many papers saying that the healthcare system gets 97% of the accumulated value. Well, that's clearly nonsense. Why were they so wrong? It's because they don't understand opportunity cost. They simply applied a very large number of willingness to pay for equality to health effects. Oh, and they picked on statins and antiretrovirals for HIV and forgot to do the same analysis for all the plethora of uh, new innovations of modest value and high prices that have been produced, and particularly the biologics where we won't get generics at 25% of the brand. It'll be more like 75% of the brand for the biosimilars if we're very lucky. So we'll return to what we should pay and what share later on. But let's be clear, at the heart of this is an assessment of health opportunity costs. What can we afford to pay for the improvements that a new innovation might offer us? In other words, the cost effectiveness threshold. Now, the notion of cost effectiveness and its threshold has been very confused in the literature and in policy circles. I think we can identify three meanings. The first one, and I think the appropriate definition of a threshold is simply how people, the criteria by which people make these kind of decisions. They're norms describing how recommendations are made. So NICE in the UK, I was a founding member of the NICE Appraisal Committee, stuck with NICE for 12 years until I realised it was much better to relieve oneself outside the tent, hugely more enjoyable, less cramped, and, uh, and, uh, and more effective as well. So, um, yeah, so NICE 
is one of the few bodies that has been explicit about its threshold, and it said, uh, was explicit in 04, that it was 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality. Let's be very clear, NICE never rejects anything below 30,000 pounds per quality. 20,000 is totally relevant, 30,000 is a start point. The latest analysis, which is now a few years old by Dakin, looking at what they actually decided, an econometric analysis, demonstrates that on average, it's about 42,000 where the probability of accept reject is 50-50. And that's before end of life criteria, a criteria introduced by a Minister of Health, a Labour Minister of Health in order to get a particularly controversial cancer drug through the system. Patricia Hewitt. Uh, long may she carry that shame with her. Um, once we add in end of life, then we're up to 50, 60. Things in the Cancer Drugs Fund are 60,000 plus. So that's kind of where we are. What about the World Health Organization? Well, until very recently, World Health Organization promoted kind of norms of one to three times GDP per capita for low and middle income countries. <coughs> there are a few other examples, but not many. So that's one. It's just a norm. Thirdly, what else could it represent? Well, it could be people's individual willingness to pay to improve their own health, the consumption value of equality, which could be founded on the literature around value of a statistical life, revealed and expressed preferences. If you look at that, you're looking at very high values. There's a good reason, and that's why value of a statistical life isn't, is not appropriate, but we'll come to that later in the discussion if you like. About £60,000 per quality in the UK is reasonable based on that literature or willingness to pay to, avert, to, to gain a quali or avert a dally, express preferences through contingent valuation in DCE. If you look at that literature, about £30,000 per quali in the UK. But the third thing it could represent, and what we need to know, is health opportunity cost. An understanding of the supply side of our healthcare system. In effect, the marginal productivity of healthcare expenditure. That's what we need to know, and that's what we've tried to estimate in the UK. Chris, could you give me a 10-minute warning? I'm not kind of quite sure how long I've got. Uh, how long do I have? Plenty of time. Okay, excellent. But I won't, I won't, I won't ease up. So that was our task. Um, the MRC funded some research now quite some time ago asking for estimates of the cost effectiveness threshold to inform decisions made by a body like NICE. Now, in the UK, we don't have the best data, but in one respect, we do have really useful data called program budget category data, where all expenditure, no matter where it occurs in our healthcare system, is allocated to 23 disease areas. They're collections of ICD code. And we have those data at local level, and we also have outcome data by ICD code at local level. And that means we can line those two things up using the variation, the cross-sectional variation by geography and expenditure and outcomes by disease area. And that's basically what we did. So we've got 23 different program budget categories or disease areas. Uh, about half of them are associated with significant mortality. Half of them are not because mortality isn't a significant aspect of those types of diseases. So that'll include things like hearing, mental health, vision, those kind of things. There might be some mortality, but very small. So with this, we can do two things. We can estimate how a change in overall expenditure tends to get allocated to these different areas. This final one is general medical services, basically things you can't allocate, uh, mainly primary care. For those where we do have mortality, we can then estimate how a change in expenditure in that disease area affects mortality in that disease area. We can, if you like, represent that as the effect that expenditure is having on the mortality or life year burden of disease. So we've got information on the age uh, 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 are uh, the age and gender distribution of the at-risk population in each of these ICD codes. So we can translate mortality effects into life year effects and represent, if you like, what we can estimate as the effect that we're having on burden of disease as measured by life years. We can then say, well, what's going to happen if we had a similar effect on burden where we cannot directly estimate effects compared to where we can? and then apply those measures of burden, 
not to life years, but to a more complete measure of burden of disease, namely quality burden of disease. And we can do that because we have those measures. We've got, uh, we've got life expectancy, life years, from, and uh, gender, uh, and uh, age distribution from ONS. We've got quality of life data from two other uh, sources, one UK, one more general. And we've got age, gender, and duration of disease from uh, Global Burden Disease Database. So if you like, we can estimate this with some hardcore econometrics. We then need to make an assumption of surrogacy that the effect we see on the mortality burden of disease is a good surrogate for the effect we're going to have on total burden. And we're also going to assume some form of extra extrapolation, which is we have a similar proportionate effect on burden in those areas where we can't observe the effect to those areas where we do. And what happens when we do that, when we apply it to these data? Well, this is pretty much what you get. This is the expected health consequences of 10 million pounds. Either 10 million pounds added to NHS expenditure or 10 million pounds taken away from NHS expenditure because we just approved a jug that's going to cost us 10 million pounds. So 10 million pounds is going to get you about 773 quality adjusted life years. But because we're estimating this by disease area, we also know something about the nature of those health effects and where they're going to occur. So if we spend £10 million on a new drug, we're going to lose 773 quality adjusted life years. But we know where the impacts are going to be in terms of mortality and survival. The big ticket numbers are cancer, circulatory, respiratory and gastrointestinal. That's, that's where we're going to take the big hits in terms of survival effects. What about quality of life effects? Well, we're going to take big hits in respiratory, in, uh, in neurological, and importantly, in mental health. Because mental health has got a very big burden of disease amongst this group here where we can't directly estimate. So, with those data, we're starting to, if you like, really start to bring to the fore the people who bear the true costs of approving new drugs, which is... Other patients, other NHS patients. The problem is they don't know who they are. Their doctors don't know who they are. And so they have no voice in this debate. Of course, those that can benefit from a new drug have a voice. Those that wish to sell the new drug have a very powerful voice. But those that actually truly pay don't have a voice. And in a way, this work is, is really about, in part, there's geeky stuff, you know, but for me, this, for me, this is the slide I'm most proud of. This starts to make the people who truly bear the cost of these social choices a little more real so that they can be properly taken into account when we make these decisions. So what do we know? Well, from our recent work, we know something about the scale of the opportunity costs in the UK. This original work suggests £13,000 gets you one quality adjusted life year. We know something about the type of health effects in terms of mortality, survival, morbidity, where they're likely to occur, by disease area, by age, by gender. We can also know something about where they're occurring in terms of is it in severe diseases or not severe diseases. The truth of the matter is, it's across the board, and some of the qualities we lose are in areas of very high uh, burden of disease. We can also ask the question, what are the effects on net production? In other words, the consequences in the wider economy. And uh, we've been able to do that working with the Department of Health. And the estimates are that £13,000 in the UK buys you one quality adjusted life year. It also gets you £12,000 worth of net benefit in the wider economy. And it also reduces health inequality because we've been able to link these effects to distributions of health by age, gender and social deprivation in the UK. We've also, since then, been able to look at affordability and the scale of budget impact. In other words, ask the question, does this threshold, do the health opportunity costs, are they greater when we're reducing expenditure and reducing it to a greater extent? And yes, they are. That's exactly what you'd expect. Diminishing marginal returns. We've also examined these necessary assumptions because we, don't, we only have national data mortality data. We don't have national quality of life data by disease area. So we need these assumptions. We've examined those through a quite elaborate elicitation from clinical experts and also policy experts. Uh, that's just in submission at medical decision making. Unfortunately, Simon Eckerman is a reviewer. So as you can imagine, that's probably six years back and forth. You know, he's obviously 
Uh, he makes a huge contribution to the social good uh, through his peer-reviewing uh, activities. Um, but nonetheless, that is already published as an EPRU report, so you can actually see that uh, before the uh, glacial progress of publication uh, eventually completes. Uh, and we've re-estimated it for all subsequent waves of data. So uh, this, oh, this is what it looks like. So these are all the waves of data we have available with mortality at the moment. We'll be able to add some more when ONS releases mortality. This was our, these three were our original work for the MRC. We've, re, we've completed it, re-estimated everything, changed the geography from, to a local authority geography which is consistent throughout the series. This is £15,000 per quality. This is what the Department of Health some years ago now has adopted as its estimate of health opportunity cost in all its impact assessments and in all its negotiations with industry. Uh, and what you can see is it's telling a pretty consistent story. It's pretty low. Uh, we've also... We have also taken a very different approach to identification. We need instrumental variables to be able to estimate all this. And our original work and the slide you've just shown, there are some potentially legitimate criticisms of the instruments that we've used. They're based on the census, and which potentially are related to health outcome. There was a piece of work published uh, just last year by Andrew Zettel and Matt Sutton, which used elements of the funding formula as the instrument. And those are great because they are, if you like, directly determined funding and three of the four elements are independent of health outcomes. So almost perfect instruments, both perfect theoretically and perfect statistically as well. And they also allow us to ask the question, what is the relationship between total expenditure and disease-specific outcomes and all-cause outcomes, which is really useful. It means that we're able to capture much more of the effects of expenditure, and it means we can estimate all-cause models which we couldn't before. I won't, go through, I won't go through these numbers, it's a bit messy. But essentially, it's just trying to show you that we can estimate the elasticity on all-cause mortality. And if we do it as an all-cause model, that tends to be somewhat lower than when we estimate it for each of these disease areas separately, and then, if you like, aggregate it back up. And that's exactly what you'd expect, because if you estimate an all-cause model, you've got huge aggregation bias because there's a lot of heterogeneity between these different disease areas. So this gives us a lot of confidence, and when we apply it to the data, this is what it looks like. So the red represents this new, uh, very different approach to identification, and lo and behold, we get ex same, exactly the same damn answer. Now this is kind of really good, because it shows that the original census instruments were reasonable, despite some quite legitimate concerns, it demonstrates that doing it two completely different ways with different instruments, we get the same answer, which means we are not looking at a very narrow local average treatment effect for those of you who are econometricians in the audience. We're actually looking at something real. So yeah, and it also shows this is all nominal. It also shows there's no growth. Hardly any growth in nominal terms and certainly no growth in real terms. Now you might find that surprising. There has been real growth in expenditure during some of these years. Why is that? Well, it's basically because the productivity of health and healthcare has outstripped the growth in expenditure, which is kind of what you'd expect. Medicine gets better. We get, have a better understanding of medicine. We get better at doing medicine, and that has outstripped the growth, the limited growth in real expenditure. So, oh, it's uh, not having it. Ah, what else do we know from other areas of the world? Well. We kind of started in the UK, but lots of others are trying to do exactly the same thing for other healthcare systems. The work, similar kind of approach to the one we took in Australia, as reported and published, 28,000 Australian dollars per quality. The work in Spain, as reported and published, 22 to 25,000 euros per quality. The Netherlands, partial, but an attempt at it, just looking at hospital care in coronary disease, uh, Peter van Baal. Uh, there's another piece of work uh, in the Netherlands which is uh, in submission. There's work ongoing in Indonesia that we're conducting, but then there's other work in South Africa as well. And there's kind of others as well. I think, you know, David Van Ness in, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States is trying to get that work going, going as well. So a lot of work going on and all kind of telling the same kind of story that in most high-income countries in healthcare systems, actually 
What those healthcare systems deliver is really quite good at the margin, and that means that what we can afford to pay for something new is a lot more modest than global prices might suggest. What, uh, what can we say, though, about other healthcare systems? Based on this evidence, what else can we say about other healthcare systems that don't have within country data that enable them to estimate it, or they may have, but they haven't done it yet? What can we say? What are the possible implications? Well, one way to do this is how we looked at it quite a few years ago now and published, but it's kind of useful to get a ballpark, which is to say, you know what, the US, in the UK, we spend about half a GDP per capita to get one quality adjusted life year. We know that the value of health varies with income, and we've got some published estimates of income elasticity of demand for health. Generally, they show that you devote a greater proportion of your income to improving health as income rises got income elasticities of demand one or greater. So if we assume that our UK estimate is reasonable uh, and that the estimates of income elasticity based on mortal mortality risk generalise to qualies, and if we believe that the proportion of underfunding of healthcare systems is similar, we would expect it to be even less, uh, even more underfunded in low income countries where financing of healthcare is, uh, is even more difficult then we can get some kind of indication of where that ballpark might be. Let me show you. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is kind of the UK estimate. And uh, this is GDP per capita. And it was this, it was these estimates that have been adopted by Norway a few years ago in their commission. They adopted the estimates based on this, based on unitary uh, elasticity of demand, um, whilst they conduct their own work within their within Norway to estimate it for them for themselves. What would it mean for Canada? Well, overall for Canada it would be about $28,000 per quality adjusted life year. Yeah. yeah, that's Canadian dollars, not US. What else can we do? Well, the truth of the matter is there is quite a substantial literature that's attempted to estimate the effect that health expenditure has, changes in health expenditure have on mortality using country level data, cross country data. Uh, there's a number of examples uh, over the years, more than 60 in fact. Uh, one particular strong one is by Bacori, uh, 07. They estimated elasticities for 127 countries. They looked at the effect of expenditure under five mortality and maternal mortality. What's nice about the paper is the account for endogeneity of health expenditure and GDP, and they've got interaction terms with measures of infrastructure and donor funding. So strong paper compared to the others. How can we use it to get to what, where we want to go? Now, a measure, in, uh, a measure of health used in low and middle income countries is disability adjusted life years rather than qualies. You don't really need to know anything about qualies and dallies. The only thing you need to remember is qualies are good, you want more of them. Dallies are really bad, you want less of them. Okay, so we want to avert dallies, gain qualies, simples. Okay, so what, what did we do? Well, we re-estimated this model, but to estimate the effect on adult male and female mortality, we could then apply those elasticities to country specific population, age, gender, mortality rates by age and gender, and conditional life expectancies by age and gender, and total healthcare expenditure. So we could take uh, estimates of elasticities and then apply them to country-specific demographics in epidemiology to get country-specific cost per DALI. We were also able to re-estimate those models to directly estimate the impact we have on years of life lost, years with disability, and DALIs itself. So we end up, I'm not going to labour this, we end up with four different ways you can use these estimates to get to a cost per dally averted. We can base everything, if you like, on the mortality estimate, which is a bit like in the UK, and then assume surrogacy to get to dallies, in other words, proportionate effect on burden. We can actually do a bit of both. So we can dire directly estimate survival, but then use that as a surrogate for disability. We can directly estimate survival and disability effects and add them together. Or we can directly estimate the effect on DALIs, directly. So we end up with four estimates. And, it, and this comparison of these four estimates actually is quite useful. It gives us a range 
but it also tells us how reasonable this, which is what we will commonly face, only having mortality and trying to translate into something like dallies or qualies, how reasonable that might be. What we find is that it's pretty reasonable. Now, we've done this for all those 127 countries. The paper for low and middle income countries, in fact, was accepted finally this morning after the third revise and resubmit by BMJ Glo uh, uh, Global Health. So coming out, BMJ Global Health, we're proper happy. So we've got that paper out for low and middle income countries. What does it mean for other countries like Canada? Well, we've got elasticities estimated from country level data but we've got province-specific mortality, cost, conditional life expenditures by age and gender. We've got province-specific public health expenditure. So, so, but we don't have a more measure of morbidity burden by province. We've got one for Canada as a whole from global burden of disease, but not for each of the Canadian provinces. So we have to basically use the Canadian one and apply it to the provinces. Yeah. These are the elasticities for Canada. They're not specific to Canada, they are the elasticities you get for Canada when you estimate for those 127 countries and take account of the interaction terms. So these elasticities are also shared with other countries that have the same characteristics as Canada. Okay, so we're making quite strong assumptions about a single global health production function that gets shifted about by the interaction terms. Okay, quite strong assumptions. What happens when we apply them? Well, this is kind of what it looks like for the, for the provinces, and this, the red dot, is for Canada overall, okay? Which is not the average across these ratios, but it's the average across all the effects across all the provinces. And this is kind of what it looks like. I mean, what we're basically seeing is that for almost all the provinces, it's all pretty damn similar, and that reflects the fact that actually the demography, the epidemiology, ain't that different. Actually, health expenditure per capita, it ain't that different. It's a little bit different, but not very different. Where it's really different is for these provinces here, which are very different, both in terms of demography, epidemiology, and health expenditure per capita, basically because it's so damn difficult to deliver healthcare in these very rural and isolated provinces. So, the problem with using Bakuri as the elasticity estimate is what we are consistently seeing is that the elasticities we get from basically trying to estimate at country level are significantly lower than the elasticities we get when we have access to within country data. And there's two re three reasons why that is likely to be the case. The first one is that when we're using country level data, we've got a massive aggregation bias going on. There's huge heterogeneity between countries which we are unable to properly reflect because we just don't have the data in the data sets. The second reason is that what we seem to be seeing, a consistent story, is that the elasticities are relatively low for low-income countries but much higher for high-income countries. Now, that doesn't mean the cost per quality is higher for low-income countries, quite the reverse, very steeply the opposite direction. Cost per Dally averted is very low in low income countries, despite the fact the elasticity is very small. What this tends to be suggesting is that there isn't a single Cobb Douglas health production function for the globe. Actually, we might have, actually, might be Cobb Douglas, but it gets shifted about depending on you being low or high income. And when you become high income and you've got access to high technology medicine and you've got really great medical schools and you've got huge infrastructure, it massively shifts your production function. You get an awful lot more at the margin than if you're in a low income country. And the third reason is that the kind of instrumental variables that we have available when we're using cross country data are not that great. You know, they're pretty weak. And it's basically because we don't have the detail that we can get at when we've got within country data. So, for Canada, what I would say is that the Bakori estimate and that elasticity, I think, is seriously underestimating what's going on. If we took the elasticity from Andrews, what they estimated as an all-cause mortality elasticity, and applied it to Canadian provincial data, you end up with about $30,000 per uh, per DALI averted, and if you apply what we've estimated from our work in terms of the all-cause elasticity, you're at about 20, 
thousand Canadian per DALI averted. If you take woods, which is where we apply our UK estimate and then just apply those elast uh, income elasticities, yeah, like Norway did, you're at about just under 30. Just under 30. So my summary of this work, uh, which is available as a working paper, isn't it? I can't quite remember where it is. Um, there's a range of values for Canada. Most provinces are in the region of twenty two hundred thousand pounds uh, dollars per dali averted. That's quite a large range, you know. I grant you. Uh, a cost per dali threshold is likely to be less than fifty thousand uh, dollars for Canada as a whole. Why do I say that? Because actually, we know that the core is underestimating those elasticities. Uh, it's likely to be similar across most provinces, apart from those other three. A cost per quality threshold, which we weren't able to estimate, is going to be similar or lower than a cost per DALI averted threshold. There's a couple of reasons why it could be lower. There are no reasons why it would be higher. Our take is that a cost per quality threshold of £30,000 per quality would be a reasonable assessment of the health effects, changes in health expenditure in Canada, based on the fact that the within country analysis, time and time again, is showing elasticities in that ballpark. Now, of course, what we really need are some direct estimation for Canada and the provinces. Um, so, using within country data, ideally disease specific as we've done in the UK because that avoids all that aggregation bias, ideally province specific as well if that's available. Really also need province specific estimates of the quality burden of disease but you know what, you can work with whatever you've got. So, um, yeah, I think the, if this is a possibility, I think the greater disaggregation in those estimates, the better. So, rather than an all-cause model, if possible, by disease area, as we've done in the UK, and ideally not Canadian-wide, but if you believe there are going to be differences between provinces at a provincial level and then aggregate up to Canada. And then we'll get a real handle on what those elasticities look like, apply them to reasonable estimates of quality burden of disease by province. Now, I don't know how we're looking on time, but I've got a series of slides that I've added to kind of reprise the issue of once you've decided what this number is, what does it mean for pharmaceutical pricing? Chris, I'll take your guidance. Uh, no, I think. I think we'll do questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll just start again. So, so um, my question is, if there are challenges with the instruments that we used in this sort of work, do you think it's best to use this estimate or wait until there is a, a more detailed Canadian estimate using, using detailed patient level data here in Canada? So can you talk a little bit more yeah. about those challenges with the instruments? Yeah, so um, I said there were challenges with the instruments. That's particularly the case with Bacori that and all those papers that have not used within country data but cross country data because if you're trying to construct a cross country data set the only things you can put in it is where every country you can record it for every country and if you don't then you've got kind of missing missing variables and then you kind of got to you know replace at random so and as a consequence the kind of instruments that we have available so there's three that Pecora uses he uses um, consumption investment ratios is an instrument for GDP per capita. That's perfectly reasonable. He uses institutional quality as an instrument for GDP and for healthcare expenditure, which is perfectly reasonable. The downside is that the data he had for institutional quality was bespoke to that particular year, generated by the World Bank, and isn't available routinely. So that's really damned annoying. Uh, the third instrument he used, which has been commonly used in the literature, is neighbouring military expenditure, okay? And 
The idea there is that if your neighbours are spending a lot on the military, then you are likely to be under pressure to spend more on military spending, and that will crowd out other forms of public expenditure. So your neighbour's military expenditure is a good predictor of your expenditure on health, but it's independent of your health outcomes per se. Uh, now, uh, insofar as those instruments are weak uh, and don't account for all the endogeneity, you will underestimate the effect. You will not have isolated the true effects of health expenditure on outcomes. If you ignore this endogeneity, endogeneity being the fact that if your health outcomes are pretty bad, you want to spend more on health to try and account for that. So when you look at the data, it appears that those that spend more on health get worse outcomes. Well, that's not what's going on. What's going on is reverse causality. And unless we're able to strip that out, then any of our estimates will be contaminated with that and we'll be underestimating true effect. So what I'd say is the instruments available to us with cross-country data are not as good, generally speaking, as within country data. As a consequence, we will underestimate effects. Secondly, the cross-country data, there will be aggregation bias. And as a consequence, we'll be underestimating effects compared to within country analysis. Thirdly, any all-cause model will have aggregation bias, even if it's within country so we'll be underestimating true effects. So I think for all those reasons, what I'd say is that the kind of numbers we get for Canada based on the cross-country work are if, you know, are, we are underestimating the elasticity and therefore overestimating the cost per quality. And I suppose, I mean, my take is that the best... If Canada had its own estimates, use those. You don't, but you face a policy choice now. You can't put it off. You can't say we're not going to choose, because whatever you do, you're going to choose, implicitly or explicitly. There's no putting this off. And I guess what I'd say is, if, you, if you're going to choose, I would say use the published elasticities that we do have available from other similar healthcare systems. And I guess that means, you know, UK, Australia, that kind of thing. And that puts you at about somewhere between thirty and twenty thousand dollars per quality. Jeff, Th thank you for that. It's really interesting. Um, so the, on the slide at the minute, is it the, the top point: public and private expenditure. Yeah. Um, when you did your estimates for the UK, did you do that including both public and private, or was it just public expenditure? No, just public and private expenditure is second order of smalls in the UK. So it's not kind of a big issue for us. What we are doing now, we're just about to move on to it, is we're starting to break down into different categories of public expenditure. So we're re-estimating everything where we've got NHS expenditure, and then we've also got public health expenditure in there as well. So public health expenditure now is something that the NHS doesn't do, but local authorities do. And we're going to break down NHS expenditure into its component parts as well. So we can break that down in different categories, including pharmaceutical spending. Now, private expenditure, we haven't been asked to do it. It's an interesting question. We could include it in the, exactly the same way. I think it's so small in the UK that it's really second order of small stuff. That's not true in Canada. It's much more significant in Canada, as I understand it, if I'm understanding the Canadian healthcare system. Um, uh, uh, what's the elasticity of private health expenditure? Uh, it's a judgment call. Say so similar, possibly a little bit. Uh, uh, I've written a little bit higher. Hi. Hi, Carl. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I, uh, I guess I have a two-part question. Um, from this, I, I think you're clearly advocating that uh, in the policy arena, uh, we do need a net health benefit estimate. Mm. Um, and so that involves some supply-side estimate of that cost-effectiveness threshold. Mm. Um, and then, I, I guess from the beginning of your talk, you spoke about the 
uh, net health benefit, and when net health benefit is zero, all the value is going to that manufacturer. Um, so I guess from a decision um, perspective, would you actually um, advocate for some net health benefit estimate that's greater than zero to be like when, when you're negotiating for prices and things? Thank you. Gives me an excuse to put up the next slides. <laughs> Use these slides. You're going to have to be really quick. You've got six minutes. You remember that example where we got zero up to patent expiry and then we started to get some value when the generics came in? It's the same example, but now we're looking at what, what proportion of the value does the healthcare system retain in terms of uh, net health, in terms of health benefits. So if you like, the health gains from this innovation net of the health opportunity costs of the production costs of actually producing it. Not, not, what the, not what the patent holder charges, but the production cost. This is kind of what it looks like. Now, what's really interesting here, this is at £15,000 per quality's health opportunity cost. What this tells you is we give it all away, not just within the patent. We've given so much away within the patent. We've given away all the future benefits when it goes generic. Shocking. You never, ever, ever want to get to here. Nobody would advocate getting to here, not even not even the hired gun of pharma, the Chicago boot boy, stormtrooper of libertarianism in the West Wing with his mate Donald Trump, Thomas Phillipson. Not even Thomas could advocate getting to this point. And yet look what NICE does. It approves at 30, 42, 50. It's not an innovation premium. This is just hemorrhaging value for no reason. Let me show how it changes. We can change some of the parameters. This is a bit better. We've now only got 10 years of patent remaining. A bit better for the healthcare system. But look, we're still giving more of it away. This is, this is like really shocking. This is a biologic. We don't get 25% of the brand. We get 75%. Shocking. We actually give it all away at £17,000 per quality. So, you know... This starts to focus, I think, minds in terms of figuring out what this threshold is. Because you know what? If you get it wrong, it's not just that you're giving them a bit of an innovation premium. You're actually giving away more than the entire consumer surplus. That's really bad for the healthcare system. It's actually really bad for the pharmaceutical sector as well. Hugely distorted, overcapitalized, high cost. Does this sound familiar? So, I don't know, did, did that answer your question? Kind of. But it was an excuse to show my slides. Oh, listen, there's one exception. Of course, when incidence it grows dramatically, then actually, there's a lot of value beyond patent expiry. What's the example? Antimicrobials. The real value lies way beyond in the future. We've only got a short patent, and we've just been doing some work for DH on antimicrobials and how you can separate payment from use. In order to do that, you need to understand value over time, but you need to understand this as well. And also, what answer the question, come on, what is the appropriate share? We know you don't want to be down here, but what is it? I don't know. Neither does anybody else, because we haven't done the empirical work yet. And the empirical work involves asking the question, what do we get in consumer surplus terms in the future from giving patent holders additional consumer surplus, uh, producer surplus now? That's the piece of work that needs to be done. And how does that compare to actually using the same resources we're going to offer in consumer surplus, but actually spending it on fundamental basic science, biomedical research, translational research, and evaluative research? That's the question. It may well be that actually there are no dynamic gains, in which case, you know what the optimal solution is? We'll take 100%, thank you very much, and we'll compulsory license. And that's not because we're free riding, that's because there's no social value to your patent. I don't know what's true, we need to do the work. So 
you mentioned a few other countries that have done estimates of the threshold, and I believe the Australian estimate uh, was slightly different in that it used patient-level data. Yeah, and if, if we were to do this work in Canada, we would have access to patient-level data. So I, I'd just like to know your thoughts on the Spanish work, the Australian work, any, any work done in other countries. Are there any different methods they used that you'd consider stronger than what you were able to use in the UK? And So should, should the Canadian work build on the Australian work rather than the UK work, yeah. for example? Yeah. Listen, absolutely, and, and I think it's all about the data that you've got. So, you know, the basic principle is we want to estimate econometrically mar marginal productivity. Uh, that's what we want to do. Uh, what are the lessons from our work? Uh, the lessons from our work are there's not a lot, in the UK at least, in the time series. And the reason why is everything's hugely persistent. So the idea that you've got time series and you're going to get something useful out of that I'm not at all sure that's true. The real value, where the real variation lies, is in the cross-section. Uh, we do have now have a panel. We're working on the panel data. We've tested random fixed effects. Because of the persistence, you can kick both of those away. Um, the thing that's most useful is pooled OLS with year dummies. Um, so, so I know the Spanish used the panel, and they report that they get their best estimates without the IVs. You know, that's fair enough. You know, that's Spanish data. Um, uh, the, the Australian work, again, you're quite right. There's a mixture of time series cross-section. They, they used uh, patient-level data for the trying to... They, tried to do, they ended up doing it separately, two separate data sets. One to get the effect on mortality and, and therefore survival, and a different data set and estimation to try and get the effect on quality of life, which was time, it was a panel, I think. It was panel, and it was patient level. And I think that was really inventive, and I think they were trying to make best use of the data and avoid, I think they were anxious to avoid making the kind of assumptions that we were forced to make. Um, spit it out, Carl. I, my personal preference, would be to focus on getting absolutely bomb-proof mortality elasticities. Get bomber mortality elasticities. That may not require you to have patient-level data. Actually, the most bomber, when you think about IVs that you're going to need, may well not be patient-level. I would do that first, and then I would think about, OK, I've got that in the bag. That is, I think about things in climbing terms. So that's like a bomber piece of gear. You know, you climb three metres and you just put a sling around a spike. You know, whatever happens, you're not going to deck after that. And then I would think about how I can improve upon that. That would be my personal advice. Rather than go for something super elaborate and costly that is going to get you survival effects, quality of life effects, all at the same time. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But what you definitely want to walk away with is the mortality elasticity, because you know you can do something with that. Thank you. Uh, enlightening, entertaining, and challenging as ever, Carl. Thank you very much. Can we express our appreciation for Dr. Claxton? Thanks, Chris. <laughs>